Well, good afternoon. It is very nice to be addressing this esteemed group and to see actually a lot of old friends here and so forth. And I think, you know, following on uh, Teresa's comments and so forth, I mean, I'd just like to talk about what we're thinking about from a policy perspective, you know, what's going on, you know, over in the President's office. Clearly, I, I, you know, this is all past, right? So, you know, we know tonight is a very big night and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens this evening. But if I, if, you know, one of the things that I have learned is even, even punctuation is important, you know. So as I look at this, is it manufacturing the road to success or manufacturing the road to success? And my kids said, yeah, yeah, we learned about that too the other day. You know, they said, you know, for example, let's eat grandma or let's eat grandma, you know. And so I thought, well, that's very important stuff. And, and I will tell you that comma is, is very important, you know, as I've learned. But, but really, and I, and I think that we've seen this across the board, and, and, and my first slide here, and I don't have that many slides, but I want to point out that science and technology is a presidential priority. You know, we've seen that time and time again, 60% increase in the federal R&D budget, you know, and the objective is to hit a factor of two. You know, but you know, by by the end of the president's term, his second term. So basically, it is you know, and and, and you know, and I we can quote the president here reaffirming America's role as a, as the global engine of scientific discovery and technological innovation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this has really been driving you know what we you know what we're moving forward on, and we have heard you know about some initiatives related to advanced manufacturing. So you've heard about the. National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, and, uh, but there are a number of other ones that tie together quite well. You know, there's the materials genome, right? So my colleague uh, Cyrus Wadia over at over at OSTP, where we're taking, in fact, actually, if if, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the uh, um, the graphic over there, yeah, it looks like some of the, the fonts have changed around a little bit on me, but that's okay. You know, but but the idea really is, you know, we've got human welfare, clean energy, next generation workforce, national security, and by the way. It is about the nation's economy and national security. I mean, that's what manufacturing boils down to, those two things, okay? Um, but materials genome, hey, new materials are coming along. How do we design and develop and produce those in half the time? And it's about using the computational tools, the modeling, the digital data, but then the experimental tools. A lot of, in fact, you know, what Mike was talking about earlier today, how do we provide those tools which you know, now, you know, could scale up into the millions of dollars easily, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, you know, to allow our industry to move forward. And again, even at hundreds of millions of dollars, some of our major industries have a tough time swallowing that one. What about our small and medium-sized enterprises, really the backbone of the U.S. job economy? Um, STEM initiatives. You know, I mean, I can say this very clearly. The president is very big on STEM initiatives. I show this picture here. It's one of my favorite pictures. Go online. If you haven't seen this on YouTube, you know, it's the, it's the White House Science Fair from February 2012. And I believe this is the marshmallow cannon. Um, and I can tell you this, okay, how this was supposed to work, okay, was the, uh, the young man there was supposed to fire a marshmallow and the president was going to catch it. I can tell you the Secret Service is not hot on any kind of cannon being pointed at the president. So that was next. The next thing is, they said, you know, before the president walks in, what do you have there, young man? Marshmallow cannon. Does it fire marshmallows? Yes. Okay, so we're not going to fire at the president. No. You're not going to fire it at all. We are in the east wing of the White House. Okay, you know, lots of, break anybody been to the White House, right? Lots of breakables, bad, you know, let's not fire things. The president walks in, what do you have there, young man? Marshmallow cannon. Does it work? Yes. Let's fire it off. <laughs> yes, sir. So you go look at the video. I mean, it was great. Now, the president was very concerned. He cleared everybody out of the way, you know, so they weren't hit by a marshmallow and so forth. <laughs> but it was, it was absolutely outstanding. But he is into it, and he gets it, you know, and he sees how these things move forward. If you look at, for example, additive manufacturing, we can see, right? I mean, I think a lot of us grew up, you know, working on cars, so forth. You know, I crack open my car today. You know, I'll knock BMW, you know, so I came out of BMW. Open up the BMW, you know, you're like, well, why do they even have a hood? You know, you open it up and there's a plastic covering over it and you can't get to anything anymore. And it's probably a good thing because it's probably well beyond my technical expertise at this point in time. But the problem is, is the, the kids don't have things to work on. And so now you've got an additive manufacturing. I was just at a, at a, at a meeting in, in North Carolina yesterday. Chris Anderson, you know, if you haven't read about the maker movement, you know, Chris Anderson, sort of the whole maker movement, you know, talks about, hey, these kids are now engaging. They can design things, they can put things together, and they really understand what it's like to, to realize things, to actually make things, okay? 
And by the way, it's cost effective. We don't have to have machine shops and so forth in, in, in high school, even in universities. You know, we can make some of these things. And by the way, it's sort of, it's a whole lot safer than the, you know, bandsaw and drill press and things like that. Um, so these are the types of things that are moving us forward. And really, as, as Teresa mentioned, you know, ensuring the talent pipeline. Things like the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, I can tell you the MEP, you know, we are really taking a look at that because these are reaching out into the small and medium-sized enterprises. You know, so as we start to look at the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, for example, and again, as Mike mentioned, you know, that, that missing middle, how do we scale up? You know, we're very, very good at getting to TRL, you know, three. How do we go from, you know, three, scale it through four, you know, up to seven? And I think everybody here knows the story about all sorts of different types of technologies that were developed here and are now produced overseas. And by the way, you know, my personal opinion is say, well, hey, let the market go the way the market goes. I think that that's fine as long as your competition does the same thing. I mean, I think that that's, you know, sort of the important thing, all right? And so if you want to make that point, I think that that's a very important point to make, all right? So as, as Teresa already mentioned, you know, I, you know, if you haven't, I'm sure everybody's here, all, all deans are well read and so forth because you have lots of time on your hands to surf the network. But, you know, the three key areas, and, and these are the things that I think the first two. In fact, I've talked to about, I think it's about 33 economic development offices for, the, you know, for, thir for 33 different states in the nation. Uh, and the first thing I always zoom in on is number three, improving the business climate. And I said, I'm OSTP, you know, S and T, science and technology. So, so well, I'm, you know, interested in, in one and two and what can we do over in those lines. But really, you know, and again, I, I'm not going to dwell on this. We're going to have some time to discuss it. Um, but enabling the innovation, this means things like patents and so forth, something like 70 percent, right? 70 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 90 percent of all patents come out of manufacturing. That's what drives manufacturing. Because right? if you patent and you don't make it, Okay, you know, I mean, it's sort of nice. You can, you know, you, you can get it. What is the, you know, the gold-plated patent to hang on the wall? Looks nice, but that's about it. And the talent pipeline, I want to point out something, and this is where, you know, we really need to be thinking about these community colleges and so forth. This is where we need to engage. All right, we really have to leverage our capabilities there. Talent pipeline is not only training the next generation, it's training the current generation. I don't know if any of you, you know, you get your little, you know, form from the, uh, Social Security office, you know, about when you're going to retire. We're up to, what, anybody know? Like 70, 70 years old now, is it? You know, and how, how much further is it going to go? But you're in the workforce from, you know, age 20 to age 70. It's 50 years. Think about what's your car. I'm a car guy. Think about the car 50 years ago, right? The other, I, I actually, you know, my cell phone's not here. I took it away, so it didn't bother me while I was up here. But think about your cell phone 50 years ago. Whoa, it didn't exist, right? I mean, you know, that's it. And again, we're only talking technology. Think about the business models that have changed. Even 15 years ago, we would just give you a cell phone if you buy a two-year contract. What are you, nuts? You know, think about what's going on with the maker movement. You know, how is that going to change things? So it's not just the technology, but how we're going to be using that technology. So some thoughts before I kind of wrap up with, with a little bit more, you know, philosophical things. But these are things actually that I did. I mean, I sat down. I mean, I had the opportunity to present about manufacturing to PCAST, you know, and here are some of the key things. I think Teresa's hit on them. We've got to improve the reputation of manufacturing. I can tell you at the BMW plant, if you're ever in South Carolina, go to BMW Manufacturing, sign up for a tour. It's five bucks. The only reason they charge you five bucks is so people don't sign up and not show up, okay? So it's five bucks. You go there, you're like, my gosh, I could eat off the floor in the factory. My German colleagues will say, yeah, you could, but we won't let you because you'll make a mess in our factory, okay? We need to engage and support our states. All right. I mean, I think we hear time and time again that we're not going to pick winners or losers in the federal government, and I think it's the right approach. All right. But the states do not have this problem. You know, they will go after certain industry sectors and so forth very clearly. And we need to be working along those lines and engaging the states not only from the federal level, but also from our university levels. We have to engage and support the small, medium-sized enterprises. This is where the bulk of the workforce goes. And without those enterprises, our big OEMs are in a lot of trouble. Now, we need to think about developing an educational baseline for manufacturing. I think this is sort of in a, in, in a couple of different ways. You know, if you're an engineer, you get a bachelor's degree in engineering, and you go into the engineering profession, I know a lot of them don't, but if you do, about 90 95% of those engineers will encounter manufacturing, will be part of manufacturing at some point in time. And do they have the right training? 
I think the other thing that we need to look at is what we're doing in terms of training our K through 12 students in manufacturing. You know, I mean, when I was a student, you know, if, if you were, you know, really, you know, on, on top of your game, maybe your senior year, you would do calculus. You know, now I mean, they're doing calculus like their freshman year. I don't know, you know, eighth grade. You know, it's you know, like you know, I mean, really young. So, should we be pushing that earlier, you know, or should we be supplying them with capabilities like some basic statistics and so forth? I mean, it's it. It surprised me, but not surprising. I mean, it's obvious, you know, hindsight is 2020. but one of the hottest job areas right now or hottest skill sets is the ability to an analyze big data sets. You know, I mean, this is what people are looking for. And that's something that you really don't need a lot, you know, I mean, so for some of the fundamental basic stuff, you don't need a lot of calculus, and you could teach that to high schoolers and get them geared up, you know, for these areas. <clears throat> As universities, we also need to be thinking about acceptance of a little bit more of the applied research because this is the direction it's going, okay? You know, we have got to be able to move forward from that bench top. It's great, you know, to get to the, to the lab, the bench top, but how do we scale that up to make a difference to our nation, you know? And the agencies have identified that, you know, so that's where the funding is gonna be. Well, so, you know, we either basically tell our young faculty members, sorry, you can't play in this sandbox because you don't have tenure and you're not gonna be able to get tenure in this direction, you know? Or we need to do a little bit of rethinking there. You know, and let them be engineers. Um, and finally, we need to think about just completely thinking in a new fashion. So I just pick on additive manufacturing. So the, the, the picture over here on the, on the left, you know, this is, I think this is a famous one out of Airbus, where they redesigned this bracket, you know, it's sort of functionally, you know, the, as strong as the other one, but it's lighter weight. You couldn't make it any other way, but additive manufacturing, we don't think about that. Our design tools are not there are thinking, you know, I want to put a hole in, oh, I'm going to drill a hole. I don't, you know, additive manufacturers, hey, I can put material around that. By the way, it doesn't need to be a round hole. It doesn't even need to have a constant cross section. I got to tell you, it's so wonderful to be able to say that to a bunch of people who understand that, you know, I think. <laughs> um, you know, but you've got to think in a completely different fashion. And I put up the, I put up my friend the F-35, okay? It is a very complex system. And we're still doing a lot of learning during the manufacture of that aircraft. And I've heard, and I know extrapolation is a very dangerous thing to do, but the extrapolation is that the next generation aircraft will take 65 years for initial conceptualization to deployment in wing force. Okay, 65, that's like building a cathedral, right? I mean, you know, you'll be dead. I started working on this thing when I was a junior engineer. I'm dead before the thing is flying, okay? We cannot move in that direction. We can't afford it. But I think what's happened is we've done small little epsilons in terms of our development capabilities. We need to rethink things. We need to completely redo things, okay? I don't think it's happening. We've gone from digital, I'm sorry, analog to digital. It's funny, I wrote a paper the other day, said, hey, you know, people said, you'll never replace my LP. You'll never replace my Kodachrome. You can't get Kodachrome. In fact, I type Kodachrome in, Microsoft Word, it doesn't recognize Kodachrome anymore. So I think it's, you know, so, so we are moving, but we do need to rethink things. As far as manufacturing goes, I want to make it very clear. Global well-being, wealth creation, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, it is important. There's my friend, the KUKA Titan 1000 robot. 320 were put into the BMW plant. Yes, we lost some jobs. We got some higher paying jobs. But because of the improved efficiency, within four years, we doubled the size of that facility, generating 3,400 new jobs. Okay? We have to understand that. Otherwise, those jobs are going to go away. And I just quote this philosopher, Eric Hoffer. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Some of my colleagues in academia don't like this statement, but it is true. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Okay? And I think that this is something that we have to remember, because if we don't, I think our competition in China and in India will be remembering that for us and reminding. So, I'll just look back about a year ago, a little bit longer than a year ago, you know, in terms of really where we see things going. And I, and I find inspiration in this. This is from the State of the Union last year, and the President said, think about an America within our reach, a country that leads the world in educating its people. So I'm talking to the deans here right on. An America that attracts a new generation of high-tech manufacturing and high-paying jobs. A future where we're in control of our own energy and our security and prosperity aren't so tied to unstable parts of the world. By the way, great advantage for the United States in terms of its stability, okay? Um, and finally, an economy that's built to last, where hard work pays off, and I think, you know, again, key thing, uh, my grandparents came here in the 20s, 
this is what they were thinking, where hard work pays off and where responsibility is rewarded. It's exactly what we teach our students in our classes. This is what we need to move forward. This is what manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, is going to allow us to do. So I thank you for your attention and for letting me pontificate a little bit to you. <laughs>